Pastor Tim Weiser. And, uh, I don't know about this title. They, they changed it a little bit on me. What exactly does jurisdiction mean, right? You know, jurisdiction and levels, types of prisons. Uh, this is, will be to inform you of how those are who are brand new to prison ministry, and also those that are not brand new, and also give you information uh, about the differences in prison, jail, and mental health ministries that I take care of. Uh, and this comes from uh, this quote here from the prison ministry guide. says here, while the people in our prisons defy stereotyping, there is one discernible pattern. Most lack the moral training that would have been considered normative in our society. What's normative anymore? You know, as anything <laughs> goes, right? They are coming from broken families, schools that fail to teach the difference between right and wrong, or even acknowledge that such absolutes exist. That's by Chuck Colson. And, uh, you know, the devil's going to work overtime on us, right? The further along we get into our, our Christian walk with God, you know, and he's, he's there, he's trying to make good look evil and evil look good. And pretty soon people don't know, you know, whether they're coming or going. So, and so no matter what the setting you are in, you must treat each person as an individual. Each has a particular interest in feeling and experience. Each with needs and concerns, needs to be cared for and related to one by one. That's how Jesus ministered to people. And that's how you too must work if you're going to minister in any of these settings. The first rule of ministry is these settings is learning and following the rules. You know, these guys, they know the rules. And like we learned in some of the other plenaries that, you know, they're going to see how far they can stretch you. What, what is this, this guy willing to do for us? And then if you give him one time, even to one, one prisoner, they will know. So, no, this guy's easy pickings. Let's, let's go ahead and, and see what else we can get him to do for us. And before you know it, they're asking you to take some stuff out to their loved ones and not to bring anything in or take anything out unless it's approved by the, by the chaplain. And if you don't have a chaplain in the areas that you work in, then you, you need to talk to what's called the Religious Service Coordinator. They have, have all the answers. <clears throat> the first rule of ministry in these settings is to follow the rules. The current uh, chaplain at Big Muddy River, he is, uh, he's really a really wonderful guy. He, uh, he sends us by email, he sends us these uh, uh, blasts and everything every week that talks about different things that go on in the prison and what the rules and regulations are. And, and it serves as a good reminder because, you know, all these things we got going on, we, we, we forget some of the rules and regulations. And, and we don't consciously, you know, want, want to break the rules or anything, but, you know, it happens sometimes. And, and if you don't have those reminders, you know, it's like you, you fall short of it. Uh, the first time I went to a prison to volunteer, I was very scared. In fact, it, it was, uh, prison ministry was the last thing on my radar. I, I never wanted to be a prison minister. And I, uh, at, 
had to do an institutional module at the seminary. And my original one was at an all-black uh, uh, nursing home in South St. Louis. But the guy that was supposed to be my mentor and my supervisor got real sick and had a stroke and almost died. I said, Weiser, you're going to have to pick another, another institutional module. Well, guess which was the only one that was open? <laughs> prison ministry. I don't want to do prison ministry. Those, those thugs don't deserve it, right? You know, as one of my bosses said, Weiser, that's some stinking thinking there, right? <laughs> you know, because it is. You know, they, they all deserve our love and, and, and to deal with them. And so the first time I went to prison, I kept saying to Pastor Holmes, you know, in my mind, I didn't say it out loud, please turn around, please turn around, please turn around, the closer we got. Well, then I go through one locked door, two locked doors, three locked doors, nine locked doors before I even get to the uh, chapel area. It's like, okay, maybe I'm safer in here than I am out there with the other idiots. Did I just call myself an idiot? Yeah, I did. Right? And, and so, you know, here I am. I'm the fourth division black belt in Taekwondo, a big football star and all this stuff. Man, I was scared to death. And they told me not to tell anybody that you were scared in there, right? So the Lord led me. First thing I said, you know, guys, I'm scared. <laughs> and it's like one guy came up to me, puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, Pastor, you never have to worry in here. If anything ever happens in here, we'll take care of you. Well, you can read that two different ways. Are they going to take care of me, or are they really going to take care of me? Right? I knew he meant it in the good ways. I said, well, okay. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't scared after that. But there's many, many rules and regulations, and we have to remember those of you that have served in, in prison ministry, this thing called the count. You know, and it has to it has to come out just right, you know, all the people in this area. Well, it didn't actually happen where I was, but one one night two inmates escaped in, in the detention center. And all of a sudden there was everything was locked down. And it was like, couldn't call my wife and tell her I wasn't going to be home tonight because, you know, until things got straightened out, you know, you're, you're not allowed to leave. And it's like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> you can't, can't call out or anything. You know, they have their, their radios and stuff to, to call out. So. But it was like two days before it got straightened out. Where they finally found those two inmates. Okay, I don't want to go through that again, <laughs> but, but you know, the rules are the rules and we have to follow them. And the rules and procedures vary with the institution and with the level of security. You know, the two prisons that I, uh, two main prisons that I serve are, are medium security. And they have a different set of, of rules than what a minimum security and maximum security had. Uh, the one uh, uh, super max that uh, I was serving for a time and then they closed it down in Illinois, so we, we couldn't go in there. But they have, uh, uh, they're in their cells 24 hours a day and we, go up to this little window and, you know, talk to the prisoners and bring them Bibles and stuff that we were allowed to bring in. And we, uh, what we need to do is, uh, 
And then with the medium security, uh, after the Supermax closed, a lot of the guards were applying for positions in the medium security. And they got to the point where they wanted to run it just like the maximum security. And they were all pulling for, for the inmates to be in their, their cells for 24 hours a day. And so well, this is a medium security. Why, why would you want to do that? I said, well, it's a lot easier. <laughs> you know, we don't we don't have to put up with people like you. People like me? What's what's wrong with me? And I, at at the same prison at, at Big Muddy, seventy to eighty percent of the, the people that are in that prison are uh, sex offenders and most of them are pedophiles. And man, it is just just really hard, like I said yesterday. You know, it's really hard to say that you love somebody like that, right? You know? And I had a situation at my last parish. We would, uh, you know, we had a meeting about it, and it was said that anybody that I baptized or anybody that I confirmed, they would be a member of our church. And everybody agreed to it. And so, you know, that gives them some uh, sense and then when, when they get out, if they ever get out, most sex offenders don't get out in the state of Illinois because they have to have a place to go and they have to have, uh, they have to have, uh, you know, employment and everything, but nobody wants to hire a sex offender, right? And, and so I, uh, one time, one guy did get out. And he came up to me, he was off probation and parole, but he still had to register as a sex offender. And he, he, he told me, he said, Pastor, I want to come to your church and thank them for all that you did for me, that they allowed, allowed me to be a member of this church. And I also want to do a Bible study there. And well, I, I'm checking. I better check with the church council first before I, I commit to anything like that. And we got a new church president, and he says, Pastor, do you know what that guy was in prison for? No, I never ask him, right? If they want to tell me, they can tell me. Because you know, when somebody tells you what they're in, in for, a lot of times I'll judge them just like people do on the outside, right? And I said, well, I just looked it up on the internet. He's a sex offender. We don't want people like that in, in our church. I said, you know, there's, there's two problems with what you just said. For one thing, this isn't our church. This is God's church. And if it's God's church, I'll, I'll be there with, with anybody that comes here. I said, what if, what if this guy hadn't told you that he, that I, that he was going to come here? He said, you would have just showed up at the church. You wouldn't have known the difference, would you? And well, I do know the difference. And so, so absolutely not. This guy is not going to come. And I said, what if God ju judged us that way? You know? There would be none of us that would be deserving to be in his church. He says, well, Pastor, I'm going to do everything I can to get you out of this church. Right? So he did. And the thing was that the congregation that I served was a rural congregation represented by four families in the whole congregation. And they were all related in some way. So here I was, the outsider, you know. And so, but he eventually, you know, it wasn't because of him that I, I got out. 
Um, actually, it was because um, my wife and his wife were best friends. And after all this happened, she wouldn't even say hi. I said, you can pick on me. I got broad shoulders. I can handle it, right? But you pick on my wife, and it's all over, right? And I, was, I wasn't planning on going. I, I was extending a call to go down to Anna. I wasn't planning on going there. But after he came to me and said, Pastor, said, I've never had a pastor that was so unfriendly as you. You never go and visit our people. You're always doing prison ministry. It's like uh, the person that he was talking about. I had just spent a whole week with the family, night and day, before their loved one died of cancer. That's not enough. But there was one time when, when I, I wasn't available to go see him. So everything else was was that, right? You, know, you didn't never came in to see me. You know, so, you know, so they they gave me extended me the call, and I said, "Well, I'll, I'll go down there and check it out." Right? And so Pastor Rebecca was the vacancy pastor there. Mm -hmm. And I know some of you know that he rides a Harley, right? <laughs> and that night, that weekend that my wife and I were there, uh, he was riding in, and I was supposed to just observe and everything, get introduced to the congregation. Well, he hit a deer on his motorcycle, right? <laughs> so he gives me a call about, 10 minutes before the service was supposed to start. And he said, Tim, you're going to have to do the service. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm in the hospital right now. And so I get, get there and I said, well, you people really know how to welcome a prospective pastor. You know, you put him in service right away. <laughs> and then I got to looking at, you know, all the different prison ministries and stuff that was associated with this. Because uh, in uh, the uh, Southern Illinois district, uh, we have uh, grants and stipends and stuff for people that do prison ministry, which is, uh, you know, this uh, deal with the, uh, uh, that they were a very small congregation and they couldn't afford to pay. So that's why I'm in four, four different prison ministries. Because before that, I was uh, I spent 22 years as an organic chemist for an environmental lab. You know, and, and I was like, my kids said to me, he said, Dad, do you know what a pastor makes in this area <laughs> versus what a, chem a chief chemist over 37 <laughs> chemists makes? Said, well, yeah. But I, I said, I also didn't want to end up in the belly of a whale for three days. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then they had, at the time I was, I was still doing uh, big money. I'm still doing big money, still looking for somebody to do that. But uh, they had showed at the mental health center. And the mental health center is... Uh, in the forensics part, these are guys that have committed major crimes, but now because of problems in their brain with mental disorders and stuff, they have the mental capacity of a four or five year old. So what I do with them is a lot of children's messages and stuff. You know, because the average age of my congregation is 70, right? I have 10 members over 90. <laughs> so, I will. What I do with them is I, I will have, um, I will read three three words of the, the passage, and then I'll have them repeat it after me. And say, wow, we 
get to read the Bible. You know, this is a wonderful pastor. You know, we get to read the Bible. Everybody else just always read to us and everything. And uh, but these guys, they're they're in there, you know, 24 hours a day behind locked doors and everything, and they they never get to come out. And so there there was a, a, a husband and wife team that that were uh, doing the, the pastoring on uh, uh, the second Thursday of the month because I I had uh, I was in the involved in the uh, uh, South Africa Prison Ministry Task Force and that's when the meetings were in Belgium. So, but then they after going through all these rules and regulations and everything. We got a new uh, religious service coordinator, and they had had a, uh, an episode at there where, where somebody uh, beat up one of the, the people, uh, residents in the uh, in the. Uh, sorry, I'm still having a little bit of chemo. But uh, so I forget sometimes what I'm about to say. But they had a guy that uh, had actually uh, beaten one of the residents, and he actually actually locked him in in a, a closet. And it was like three hours before they found him in this closet. And so they they started having more stringent regulations and everything. And so. So there was a period of time where uh, there was three months where I couldn't go into the mental health facility because they had to get all this straightened out. And they, they require a yearly uh, background check and fingerprinting. In my 11 years in, uh, in prison ministry, I have been fingerprinted 17 times been through 17 background checks and said, man, I, I've been fingerprinted and background checked more, more than the actual prisoner, right? <laughs> you know? And so it is, um, you know, there is requirements. And then at the, uh, uh, the jail and, and detention center that I serve, uh, we have, uh, you look at the chart here on, on the second page here. Uh, the state, this is what you came here for. Uh, so these comparisons, the status of conviction in prisons, they've been tried and convicted in the jail and detention center. They often have not been convicted of anything Many are being held for pending trials. And this is just an aside. In 2013, I uh, had the privilege of going to uh, South Africa, uh, to Johannesburg, to help the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate uh, get their prison ministry started there. And, you know, there was a, all these other places that were doing it, like Kairos and Prison Fellowship and but we wanted something that was uh, strictly uh, LCMS Lutheran. And that, that went really well. And, but, you know, they, they're, they don't have any jails. Okay? If a person is, uh, commits a crime, they go directly to the prison. And they're held there until their trial comes up and stuff. And they don't have the right to a speedy trial like we do here. And so if they they don't have money to grease the palm of the, the, the keepers, they'll, they'll stay in there sometimes for five, six years before they even have their trial. And thank God that it's, it's not that way here. And, but, they are, and then in the uh, de detention center part of it, 
these are people that have uh, are over here illegally, and their immigration and customs enforcement has, has has brought them in. And the uh, detention center that I serve, it, it's actually owned by an individual company, and I don't see that very often. But, but um, so they. They have to have these very strict uh, rules and stuff. Used to be, I I would go in there and we, we would have uh, Bible study and stuff in, in the uh, gymnasium, and um, there would be like a hundred to one hundred and fifty uh, people that would come out for the service, and then. Uh, through an audit, they decided, and then they, they also got, got women in there the second year that I was there. And so, of course, they can be mixed together in the same Bible study. So I would go down there, and i get there at 6 o'clock in the evening and have five different Bible studies. I usually don't put my water until 10, 30, or 11 when, when they do the counts and stuff. So, but what started out as supposed to only be a couple hours has turned into four or five or more. If I go to see people that are in the, um, um, in the segregation unit. And so, but most of the ones in the immigration and customs part of the are from Mexico. So I'm really trying hard to learn Spanish, right? You know, but uh, it's going about as well as Greek and Hebrew did, so, <laughs> which wasn't good. So, but I'm, I'm learning. I, I can read it pretty well, but uh, to listen to native speakers speak it, just like us, they have different dialects, right? You know, it's like, okay. Uh, that, uh, I thought it was Pakita that means small, right? Oh, Poco, Poco. So, okay, whatever. <laughs> and then in the forensics and the mental health, like I said, the, the forensics people are awaiting trials. And the upper and lower treatment people are waiting for their medicine to kick in to be released from the facility. And I think as you see a little later on, you have your frequent flyers, and there's people that have been released to come back, released to come back, because they decide that they don't need the medication, right? Okay, the population of the inmates or residents. Uh, in the prisons, it's comparatively stable. It's under one jurisdiction, either the state or the federal. And the jails and detention center, they're highly transient. They're accused of offenses under federal, state, county, or city law. And then the forensics population is fairly stable, but also depends on the crimes that they have committed and what their mental state is, and whether or not there is an improvement. And the ones that improve, they, they go upstairs, which is called the step-down unit. Why it's called a step-down unit when you go upstairs, I don't know. But, but anyway, uh, these, these are guys that, you know, their mental capacity has started to increase through counseling and, and things, and, and they, uh, and that's one step from uh, going through trial or either, either that or going home. Because if they have uh, have uh, the uh, uh, mental instability uh, claim, you know, why, why they did the, the crime and everything. So, uh, it's called uh, insanity, insanity plea. Then those, those people. Most of the time, they, they will stay in the forensics area. 
And then, like I said, the treatment facility, people come and go fairly click, quickly. However, uh, you have your frequent flyers. And with the uh, facilities and programs for counseling and rehabilitation, prisons must have a minimum of programs available depending on whether it is a state or federal facility. And I have a, a good relationship with um, uh, two of the psychiatrists that are at two of the facilities that I serve. They're actually husband and wife. One serves at, at Big Muddy, and the, and the wife serves at Show. So I actually met them from uh, uh, the the LERT program through the uh, uh, disaster relief in the Lutheran Church, and I had actually met them up there. As it turned out, we, uh, so, uh, I see you every 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 week. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, yeah, I'm the psychiatrist that, that takes some of your guys away. <laughs> and the ones that, that need the sex counseling. Right. And then uh, in the uh, jail and detention center, they have few or no facilities or programs available. And like was said earlier, you know, a lot of these guards and a lot of these jail administrators, they don't, they don't want chaplains in there. They don't, you know, because it takes away from their their particular. What, what they want want to happen, you know. but you know it, it's really wonderful because uh, they say, you know, after after they they've been to church service or a Bible study, they're so much more calm and everything. And so, well, why don't you want want us in there then? You know, if it, if it makes your job that much easier. Well, you know, we, we, we just heard a lot of bad things about this situation. You know, people giving favors to the inmates and stuff, and then we can't control it. Well, I said, well, I'm not that, that kind of chaplain. I said, what's up? Um, I know uh, Dixon Springs, where I do the ministry at, mm -hmm. now and then I, uh, I have a question and answer session that I do with them. Um, now and then I'll go over 10 minutes, which I'll apologize to the inmates for that. There's a thing keep on going. And then, but I'll also apologize to the guards. And they said, hey, we were kind of enjoying a little bit. <laughs> so, so at times I have noticed that they don't necessarily mind us a whole lot, but it'll, I think it'll depend on the institutions. But like I said, at least it makes a difference. So, uh, the guards have actually, they don't mind me a whole Yeah. Uh, they try yeah. not to. Feel free if any of you have any questions throughout this thing. Just kind of related to that, and this is up in Madison, Wisconsin, the county jail there. Uh, we've had difficulty getting people in because they say we've got too many Bible studies. We don't need any more of those. Um, have you encountered that? And, and what yeah, and in, in fact, uh, at Big Muddy, one of the prisons that I served, had, um, you know, we have a certain amount of Christian volunteers, and, you know, they have Wiccan and all, yeah, all these right. different things. And like we said yesterday in the Muslim presentation, there are so many of these guys that are converted to Islam because uh, most of them are from Chicago and they promise them all this stuff when they get out, you know, and, and so and that's the way they recruit. And it's gotten so bad there at Big Muddy that the head chaplain, he had to let uh, two uh, Christian uh, volunteers go because they needed to bring on more in imams, you know, which, because they had more more guys that were going convert. Yeah, is a, is a big problem. But we're there, just there to bring Christ, yeah. bring Christ to the nations, right?
Detention centers most have no privacy in which to meet with individuals. Uh, they live in their cells for 24 hours a day. Now this is the same 
but I can't kind of deal with the, the jail that I deal with. And some allow inmates to come out up to the visiting room or the gym for a Bible study or church service. So, and then the forensics and mental health allow families to visit in a private room, but in the forensics area, there has to be an institutional officer must be present at all times. Never know what they're going to do. And a lot of times, families will try to try to bring stuff in. They they know they're not supposed to. But they, and then you have your standards of employee conduct. We're at uh, training required in conduct and responsibility ethics training involving conflicts of interest, restrictions of contact with families and inmates for at least a year after the release. I don't know what it's like in, in your situations, but we're not allowed to have any, if we're a volunteer, we're not allowed to have any contact with the families. You know, we, we can have somebody uh, within our congregation if they're willing to do it, to, to go in and visit these families and stuff. But I'm, I'm not even allowed to receive phone calls from the family or anything. And I received, when I was on vacation one time, I received a, a letter from a, an inmate that had been moved to a different facility and church secretary, she's only there on, on Sundays, and she she saw this letter addressed to me, you know, and had the prison on there and everything, and she went ahead and opened it. And so I had to report that to my chaplain at the current place and, and say, you know, this, this, I didn't look at it, but this letter uh, came to my office and the secretary opened it. And he said, well, uh, you might want to tell your, your staff and everything, which I'm really the only staff there, and tell them, you know, not, not to ever do that again. Because, and it, actually, the chaplain, after I delivered it to him, said, well, I'll, I'll show, show this to you. But he said, you know, sometimes we have to bend the rules a little bit because this guy actually wanted to thank me for everything I had done for him. All right. Then we have uh, the PREA training. I know what that is. It stands for Prison Rape Elimination. Is they have zero tolerance for anything um, you know, sexual that, that goes on. Uh, we had uh, one time in the chapel, you know, all of a sudden saw all these guys. I need to need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. So, well, you see the sign says. Uh, one at a time, right? And so, oh, that doesn't apply to us, you know, because they're going to try anything. And then uh, one guy that was subbing for me didn't know that they weren't, even though it was written on the board, he didn't see it. So he let two of them go, and, you know, they, they had sex in the bathroom and everything. So, and so, he said, well, they don't want to come to your service. You allow sex offenders in here. I said, what? I said, you know that 70 to 80% of the people that are in here are sex offenders, <laughs> right? So what's the, the chances that you're going to be in a service with a sex offender? It's probably pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah. And then when, when you deal with, uh, you have to have sexual harassment training, ethics orientation. Uh, HIPAA training in uh, 
which is, you know, according to uh, uh, the, uh, I, I don't really like a lot of things about HIPAA because I, I have a son that has bipolar disorder and while he was young, when he had it, you know, we, they, people could tell us stuff and everything. But once he became an adult, they couldn't tell me anything. You know, and our son would disappear for, for weeks at a time until he got his medicine regulated. And then he said, oh, I need to tell my mom and dad where I'm at, you know? Mm -hmm. it's like, and the whole time you're just, we're not supposed to fear or worry and everything. Somebody told me one time that it says 365 times in the Bible, do not fear, do not worry. I haven't checked it out yet, but, but at least it gives me comfort, you know, that I'm, I'm not supposed to fear. And I like to take that word fear and break it down into when we fear anything but God. Our future eternity is at risk. But when we fear God and Him only, our future eternity is at the resurrection. It's all because of what Jesus did for us. So we need not fear. Now, I can tell you that, but we still do it, right? We still fear and worry all the time. Alright, so... Get to know and support those in charge of the facility that you have the privilege of serving. You know, I consider all the ministries that I do a privilege. But you know with that privilege comes responsibility. We have to show up when we're supposed to show up, right? You know, this one guy that I, I took over for, he, he was at um, Centralia. And he was supposed to be there every Tuesday. And they were, they were in the book of Genesis, studying the book of Genesis. And I said, well, how far did you guys get? You know, because he had been here a year. He said, we're still in Genesis 1. <laughs> because he maybe comes once a month if we're lucky. And so the numbers had dropped off substantially since the last pastor was there before. And so when I first got there, I said, well, why is nobody coming to this, this Bible study? I said, well, that, that last Lutheran pastor never came. So, so when they call out Lutheran service, nobody wants to go because they they, they, they know they're going to have to come right back to their cell. They're not going to be there. And I said, well, you know, as long as the Lord gives me breath, gives me this privilege, I will be there. You know, they'll have to, you know, I let them know that the congregation takes first presence. If, if you know, I'm called out in an emergency, I will let the chaplain know that I won't be there, right? But this guy never would. And so that's, that's why. You have to be there. You know, it's just like anything else. You know, when people know that you can be trusted, then they're, they're, they're going to be there. When I, I was diagnosed with uh, stage 4 colon cancer, in 2009, I was actually given six months to live, and I had just lost my dad two years prior to that to lung cancer. So he just he said, "I just want to give up and die," and that's what he did. He only lasted three months because he didn't go through any of the treatments. So then I. Uh, when I found out that I had colon cancer and I had six months to live, I told my wife, I said, Kathy, I just want to do like Dad and go home and die because there's no hope. She said, she said, 
Shame on you. Hey, why are you talking to me like that? What would you tell one of those prisoners or your parishioners if they told you there was no hope? Why wouldn't let them? Oh, she's got me again. <laughs> you know? Because there's always hope with Jesus Christ if you're Lord and Savior. And she said, yeah, you need to tell yourself that too. So I went in a consultation with the doctor and he said, well, here's what needs to be done. You need to have 12 inches of your colon removed and then you're going to have to go through 12 chemotherapy treatments. And I heard so many bad things about you know, operations and chemo treatments. And I said, well, so I guess, guess I'll go ahead and do it. And uh, so I had 12 inches of my colon removed, went through 12 chemotherapy treatments. Halfway through the chemo treatments, I got what they call chemo burn. I lost all my memory. Some days I couldn't even remember my own name. I said to my wife, I said, is this any better than giving up and dying? She says, just hold on. God's got more for you. Because I was angry at God, you know? Because I, I just spent four years of what I call pure hell at the seminary trying to learn all this <laughs> stuff, right? For what, two years of ministry? I said, God, this isn't fair. But you know, I'm kind of ashamed of myself now. Because when I was younger, I actually tried to commit suicide three times. And now God was just giving me what I asked for so many years ago, right? But now I wanted to live. So, I said, okay. One of my oncologists said my memory would never get better. Another one said it would, would get better, but it will never be what it used to be. And I said, well, I can live with that because there's some things I just as soon forget, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like some of the prisoners that just as soon as we and, and so then I went in for a final consultation with the doctor that did my surgery. And he says to me, he says, Am I looking at the right cold? He said, The only thing that tells me you ever had. stitches in your belly and the 12 inches you call it you moved. And he was Buddhist. And he says, I don't believe in that thing you Christians call a miracle, but this is about as close as you can get. <laughs> right? And so I go to his office for the final consultation. Christian music playing in the background as a Christian receptionist. I said, Doc, what's going on? He said, I'm now a Christian. Wow. He said, your God did 95% of the work. I only did 5%. I said, you going to reduce my bill by that? <laughs> I said, no, 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 I won't go that far. But you know, he goes to India, to the, his village twice a year to doctor in that village. He said the last last year that he was there, last time he was there, his brother tried to kill him. Because you can't have you can't have a Christian in a Buddhist village, right? And he said, I'm gonna go back there every twice a year until he said, until I convert, I'll say dawn, but he said no. <laughs> until I convert every one of them or they kill me first. And that's the hope that these prisoners need, these inmates need, this, this people in jail, people in the mental health centers. Yeah. That's what they need. They need that sure and certain hope. I'll have to break that down. And he only 